voted like eight o'clock. For this next vote. Hello. Hello. And welcome to the first ever American Counseling Association Government Affairs and Public Policy Virtual Town Hall. I am Brian Banks, the Director of, Gov of the Government Affairs and Public Policy Team for ACA. I am your moderator today, and I am thrilled we have over 2,000 people here today to learn about the success and challenges of our, legisl of our legislative agenda that focuses on federal, state, and grassroots engagement. You will also have the opportunity to learn where we are headed in the future as we support you, your clients, and the counseling profession. You will hear from a host of experts, including ACA staff and members, and we have the honor of having a special guest whom you will hear from shortly. On your screen, you will now see the agenda for today. Featuring a lineup of experts, I am proud to have the honor to work with. So let's keep it rolling with a few announcements for today. A recording of the town hall will be available after today's session. All microphones will be muted and cameras will be off during the presentation. We are offering 0.50 CE credits. Attendees must be present for the duration of the program. At the conclusion of the program, we ask that you stay logged in to complete the program evaluation and attendance confirmation for the CE credit. If you are unable to stay on, we will email you a link to access the appropriate documents. Your CE certificate will be mailed to you within one week of receipt. The town hall is scheduled for one hour. However, we have a special guest, so we may go an extra five to 10 minutes. During the town hall, survey questions will appear on your screen. Please look out for them. You can ask the presenters questions by utilizing the Q&A icon on the lower portion of your screen. Friends, we have a packed agenda with a lot of great information. Before we get to the government affairs team, I would like to ask Rich Yep, CEO of the American Council Association, to say a few words. Rich? Thanks, Brian. Hello, everyone. I'm so pleased you've taken the time to attend our first virtual government affairs and public policy town hall. This town hall is a chance to gather together and share what would have been covered at our annual conference this year, as well as discuss the important work our team is engaged in on behalf of the counseling community during COVID-19 and beyond. While COVID-19 has required all of us to adjust our personal and professional goals, relationships and methodologies, it's also provided us the opportunity to reflect on how to best meet the needs of the counseling community in the digital age. As we progress through COVID-19, adapt and eventually find solutions to this public health crisis, we we'll wanna continue using successful digital platforms, apply lessons learned, and ensure accessibility for all those within our profession. Thank you for joining us during this time and making our inaugural virtual town hall a successful and rewarding experience for all. We're honored to have Representative Mike Thompson join us. He represents the 5th District of California. We're very appreciative that he is the lead sponsor for H.R. 945, the Mental Health Access Improvement Act, a bill that he and our government affairs and public policy team will discuss in more detail. As background, Representative Thompson served in the United States Army prior to his service as a California State Assembly Fellow, a California State Senator, and he's been a member of the United States Congress since 1998. During his time in the US Army, Representative Thompson was a Staff Sergeant, platoon leader, and instructor with the 173rd Airborne Brigade, where he received a Purple Heart. In 1990, Representative Thompson was the first Vietnam veteran elected to the California State Senate, and we thank you for your service. As a member of Congress who is deeply interested in the needs of his constituents, Representative Thompson has conducted numerous town hall meetings, both in person and now, during the pandemic, over the internet. Representative Thompson is a member of the powerful House Committee on Ways and Means. He chairs the Subcommittee on Select Revenue Measures and is a senior member of the Health Subcommittee. Please join me in welcoming Representative Mike Thompson.
Are you able to hear me? Right. Well, Rich, thank you very much for a nice uh, introduction. It's uh, really a pleasure and an honor to be able uh, to join you virtually. Uh, what an impressive number of people you have uh, on this, uh, on this uh, virtual town hall meeting. It's, it's astonishing. And I'm uh, also very glad to learn that I'm going to receive uh, continuing education credits. So uh, thanks, for th thanks for that. Let me know where I, where I have to file for those. Um, so seriously, I, I wanna thank everyone who's on the virtual town hall, not only for being on the town hall, but for all the work that you're doing uh, in serving the people that uh, really need your, your help. I, I appreciate that very much. And, and thank you also for all the work that you're doing to secure support for HR 945, uh, the Mental Health Access Improvement Act, uh, the bill that Rich uh, referenced that I'm uh, the lead author on. And it's a bipartisan bill. Uh, John Katko, my Republican uh, colleague from New York is the co-author in the House. And uh, we have a, a, a Senate uh, Democrat and a Senate Republican carrying the bill, the companion bill uh, in the Senate. And it's an important bill, and it would authorize Medicare coverage uh, to certified mental health counselors and marriage and family therapists. Uh, you, you know this, Se seniors really face a range of mental illness, uh, everything from anxiety to depression, bipolar disorder, dementia, Alzheimer's. Uh, they, they really need your help. And many seniors don't have access to the mental health services uh, that they need. Uh, we all know that uh, for, for certain uh, as well. And uh, that's why this bill is needed. And it's needed more today than ever before with so many seniors staying at home, and so many seniors being isolated from their, no, uh, their normal social uh, gatherings. And we also know that when the uh, shelter at home orders are lifted across the country, that's certainly not going to, going to apply to all seniors. Uh, many of those seniors are in, uh, in, in, um, in a, a medical, have medical situations that make them particularly vulnerable and uh, they shouldn't go out and they won't go out. So uh, this bill is, is really important uh, as I say, uh, right now. And it'll, it, when it's passed and signed into law, it'll ena enable seniors to receive care from uh, counselors or from uh, um, marriage and family therapists, uh, expanding the pool of providers available to seniors who are on Medicare. And uh, MHCs and MFTs are currently not reimbursed, as you well know, for Medicare uh, even though they have the same qualifications as other providers who do get reimbursed, such as our clinical social workers. And as I said, this bill would rectify that. It's bipartisan, it's bicameral. We have over 115 bipartisan co-sponsors uh, in the house and the work that you're doing to generate more interest and more co-authors is extremely important, and that will be what pushes this bill over the line. So I wanna thank you. I wanna encourage you to keep doing all the good work you're doing, making the calls, writing the letters, contacting uh, the different offices. Uh, this bill needs to become law this year. Uh, there's too many people out there counting on your help not to make sure that we get it over the finish line. So thank you very much, and I'm just honored to be able to work with you. Thank you, Representative Thompson. Before you go, we do have a couple of questions. I'll go ahead and shoot the first at you. What do you see as the barriers to passing HR 945 in order to have mental health counselors recognized under Medicare? Well, I think that what we need to do is uh, just get that number of co-authors up. Now, everything is a little more difficult now with COVID and the legislative schedule. Uh, right now, uh, we've been voting uh, all day. It's uh, 7.10 in, uh, in Washington, 
and we've got, uh, I think, four more votes, and they say that we'll probably walk off the floor sometime around 11 o'clock tonight. So that slowed everything down, and it's causing uh, a delay in passing some legislation that we need to pass. But it's the will of the people that will make this happen. And uh, if, if, if you're able to generate the support that we need, we can make it happen this year. Thank you, sir. We really appreciate that answer. At this time, we have a question coming from our audience. Stay with us one moment. It's coming shortly. Sir, while we wait for the next question, I'm curious, for your colleagues in the House that are not currently co-sponsors, what would be your suggested message to them from, to our members to ask from their, from their representatives? Well, I think it's important that uh, your members uh, contact their members of, con uh, of Congress and let them know that there's interest in these congressional districts for having this passed. And I think you should explain to them that just the things that I, that I, that I talked about, how there's a, a, a large number of seniors who aren't getting the services that they need. Let them know that their, uh, their, their problems that these seniors have are, are exacerbated because of the COVID-19 and the subsequent uh, shelter at home and how you can really provide uh, help for these folks and services that they really need. And any time you can get patients to contact, uh, that, that, that counts double. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that answer. Um, we have a question coming in now from Aaron Lofton. Aaron? Question is, what's the best way to advocate for HR 945? Uh, can, you, can you repeat that question? Sure. What is the best way to advocate for HR 945? Well, as I mentioned, the best way to do it would be to have your members contact their members of Congress and their U.S. Senators. And you should, you should not do it in an orchestrated, you know, uh, fashion. You know, the uh, grassroots is always better than astroturf. So do it in your own words. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming many of you have personal relationships with your representatives in Congress and uh, call those offices. Talk to the staff. If you can talk to the member, talk to the member. Um, write a letter. Uh, write a letters to the editor talking about how important uh, this is. Use social media. Go on your member's uh, page and uh, let them know politely that this is important and why it's important. And as I said earlier, uh, any time that you can get your clients or your potential clients to weigh in, uh, that is always helpful. Representative Thompson, thank you very much for sharing your wisdom with us today. I'll let you know our members are ecstatic about HR 945 and doing everything possible on the grassroots side to support you as our champion. Thank you so much, sir, for having us. Thank you, good to be with you. And thanks again for all the good work you're doing. Thank you. Next up, we have Government Affairs Manager Gila Todd to share updates on our federal strategy. Gila? Thanks, Brian. So, okay, first up, I'd like to thank you all for giving us the opportunity to provide you with updates on what, we're, what we've been up to. Uh, so I'm here to talk about a few of ACA's legislative successes over the past year. Uh, thanks, thanks, to AIDS, sorry, thanks to ACA's advocacy efforts, to date, we have more co-sponsors now than ever for the Mental Health Access Improvement Act of 2019. With now 114 co-sponsors in the House and 30 in the Senate, this speaks to how important mental health access is to both constituents and lawmakers. The counseling profession is now included in the federal expansion of practitioner education grants. Also, the definition of the term counselor within the grant is inclusive of LPCs and LMHCs. 
The goal of the grant program is to expand the number of practitioners to deliver evidence-based substance use disorder treatment. In 2019, ACA led advocacy efforts to educate the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, also known as CMS, on the role of LPCs and while retaining the language within the Support Act would benefit communities across the country. HR 6, the Support for Patients and Communities Act, commonly referred to as the Support Act, enables certified opioid treatment programs to bill Medicare for treatment provided by an LPC. This Medicare reimbursement is released directly to the opioid treatment program where service is rendered. In March, the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act, known as the CARES Act, was signed into law. Section 3704 of the CARES Act authorizes rural health clinics and federally qualified health clinics to provide telebehavioral health services to Medicare beneficiaries during the COVID-19 health crisis. Remote telebehavioral health services can now be provided by any healthcare practitioner working for rural health clinics or federally qualified health clinics within the scope of practice, within their scope of practice. This includes licensed professional counselors working under the supervision or a rural health clinic practitioner and within the state's scope of practice. The rural health clinics are, are federally qualified or federally qualified health clinics are eligible to bill for these services not LPCs individually. The Every Student Succeeds Act includes a, a, fle a flexible block grant program under Title IV Part A. Title IV Part A authorizes activities in three broad areas. One of those areas, Safe and Healthy Students, includes comprehensive school mental health and training on trauma-informed practices. ACA, along with the Title IV Part A Coalition, has advocated for greater funding for the establishment and retention of school counseling programs nationally. And due in part to our efforts, Title IV Part A grant program is now authorized at $1.6 billion through fiscal year 2021. Over the past year, ACA has been working with the Department, excuse me, of Veterans Affairs, specifically with Dr. Stacy Pollack, the director of the program policy implement the Director of Program Policy Implementation in the Office of Mental Health Care Services. Dr. Pollack presented at the 2019 ACA Institute for Leadership Training on careers for LPCs within the VA. Dr. Pollack also presented at the ACA Annual Conference in New Orleans and worked in the Career Center, but she was able to direct, she was able to work directly with conference attendees on VA career options. We've also collaborated with the VA on two Counseling Today articles on VA hiring practices for LPCs and LMHCs. During last year's Institute for Leadership Training, ACA also hosted a congressional briefing on the Medicare Access Improvement Act of 2019. Senator John Barrasso of Wyoming, the primary bill sponsor for S-286, spoke to a crowd which included congressional staffers and over 100 ACA members. So where are we now? Recently, your government affairs and public policy team asked ACA members to contact both the House Ways and Means Committee and Senate Finance Committee to urge the passage of S-286 and H.R. 945. We've also asked for your stories about the effect that COVID-19 has had on you and your clients. We took those stories and shared some of them with bill sponsors, Representative Mike Thompson, who spoke earlier, to help draft a letter that went to House Ways and Means urging them to attach H.R. 945 to a COVID-19 stimulus package. During the public health emergency, ACA is still advocating on your behalf virtually. Virtual meetings are being held with congressional leaders advocating for the passage of legislation that positively affects the counseling community. ACA is also part of the Medicare Access Coalition, a broader coalition of associations that are advocating for the full inclusion of LPCs as Medicare providers. Uh, finally, this is just a snapshot of all of our advocacy efforts for over the past year. ACA advocates for all counselors in all practice settings. In addition to all the efforts mentioned, ACA has been able to partner with the National Career Development Association, the American College Counseling Association, and the Committee for Education Funding. Thank you. Next up, we have Dr. Matthew Fullen, 
Dr. Fullen is an assistant professor of counselor education at Virginia Tech, co-chair of the Public Policy Committee, and one of our foremost experts in Medicare research. At the conclusion of Dr. Fullen's tenure as the Public Policy Committee co-chair, he will act as the Medicare research consultant for ACA. Take it away, Dr. Fullen. Good evening, my name is Dr. Matthew Fullen, and I am faculty at Virginia Tech, where my research focuses on the use of counseling to promote mental health and well-being in older adulthood, as well as the impact of Medicare's exclusion of licensed counselors on older adults and people with disabilities, or what I will call the Medicare mental health coverage gap. Counselors are great advocates, especially when their clients are hurting. And I want to describe why current Medicare policy, which excludes counselors from reimbursement, is hurting clients. And I hope to convince you of how important your role is in advocating on this issue. Medicare advocacy is client advocacy. The Older Americans Act states that older people have inherent dignity and are entitled to equal opportunity to quote, the best possible physical and mental health which science can make available and without regard to economic status, end quote. When Congress reauthorized the Older Americans Act just a few weeks ago, it doubled down on our country's commitment to ensuring that older people have the same access to quality health care as people of other ages. Medicare was intended to be the primary vehicle for ensuring equitable physical and mental health care, both for older adults and for people with permanent disabilities. However, today, the 60 million Americans who rely on Medicare do not presently have equitable access when seeking mental health counseling services. Medicare mental health provider regulations were last updated in 1989. The mental health marketplace has drastically evolved in the last 30 years, and there are now approximately 200,000 graduate level mental health providers presently excluded from Medicare reimbursement, but who are ready and willing to work with older adults and people with disabilities covered under Medicare. Based on my team's research, we know that the lack of reimbursement for licensed counselors results in Medicare recipients being turned away from services or forced into untimely transitions to new providers. Now, we've known for some time that a lack of Medicare reimbursement was a major problem, but until recently, we hadn't measured the scope and impact on counselors specifically. So about a year and a half ago, we surveyed over 6,000 ACA members, including nearly 4,000 practicing counselors. And what we found was that 70% of practicing counselors who responded had been directly impacted by the Medicare mental health coverage gap. This includes 50% of practicing counselors who had turned away new business due to Medicare reimbursement barriers, 39% of practicing counselors who had to refer an existing client because the client became Medicare eligible during the course of treatment, and 40% of practicing counselors who had to change their fee structure, either using pro bono or sliding scale services in order to overcome Medicare reimbursement barriers. Now, to convince Congress and the general public of the need for Medicare reimbursement for counselors, we also need to describe the scope and impact of this issue on clients. We're starting to do that analysis now, and it's becoming clear that Medicare recipients who seek mental health care are at a disadvantage. According to one popular database of providers, Psychology Today, only one out of eight providers nationwide takes Medicare. And this indicates that we have a clear mental health access issue on our hands. We have conducted qualitative interviews with Medicare recipients about this very problem. And what they have shared is that it's truly difficult to find Medicare eligible providers. They, they believe that it's inconceivable that counselors wouldn't be included in Medicare. And for clients who already are working with a counselor when they transition to Medicare insurance, they dread the thought of having to start over with someone new. Medicare recipients have described to us how frustrating and discouraging it is to have to start over with a brand new provider when they're making great progress in treating depression, substance abuse, PTSD, or other issues. 
We've even been told about major clinical issues that are going untreated and unnecessary hospitalizations resulting from a lack of access to care. The people that we've talked to, Medicare recipients, are incredulous when they learn that provider eligibility for these services was last updated 30 years ago. So this is why this issue of Medicare reimbursement is so important to the counseling profession. Medicare advocacy is client advocacy. We need you to call your lawmakers or set up a Zoom appointment to tell them about the Medicare mental health coverage gap. Tell them your stories. And if you don't have client stories to share, feel free to tell them about any of the things that you've learned about tonight. And you can use the advocacy talking points that are listed here to help you tell the story. One, tell them about the pervasive impact of this issue. Um, Medicare, Med Medicare's mental health policy currently excludes so many graduate level providers, and this impacts older adults, people with disabilities, veterans. Medicare recipients are incredibly diverse, and that means that there's a diverse impact of not being able to reimburse Medicare, be, be reimbursed by Medicare. Number two, it's important to frame this as a lack of access for clients, for Medicare recipients. I know it's frustrating for us as counselors to feel like we're not getting the same opportunities as everyone else. But really what's important for lawmakers to hear is that this issue is impacting their constituents or your clients. And number three, emphasize that counselors are represented in every other insurance program except Medicare. This includes Medicaid, TRICARE, the VA, private insurance. Medicare truly is the last holdout. Additionally, tell your friends and family, your coworkers, your students, even tell your counselor friends. There needs to be a groundswell of awareness and action on this issue if it's going, you know, if any change is going to happen. And I, I want to encourage all of us that the good news is that this really is working. As Gila shared, we have had a lot of successes recently. You know, we currently have our highest number of bipartisan congressional co-sponsors and your advocacy resulted in the changes to how the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services thinks about counselors who work within opioid treatment programs and federally qualified health centers. These are major victories. There have also been references to the Medicare mental health coverage gap in national media, local newspaper op-eds, and professional trade magazines. This shows us that we really are starting to make the public more aware of the needs of Medicare recipients and why counselors are so well positioned to meet those needs. As was referenced earlier, our latest effort is to attach Medicare reimbursement to a COVID-19 stimulus bill. We know that COVID-19 will have a major impact on the mental health of Americans and Medicare recipients are particularly vulnerable due to factors ranging from economic ramifications for retirees to the impact of physical and social distancing measures. There will continue to be mental health consequences and the ongoing need for counselors to respond. Therefore, it's inequitable and even dangerous to restrict older adults from having access to the full mental health marketplace, especially during COVID-19 and beyond. So in, in conclusion, remember that Medicare advocacy is client advocacy. And until Medicare modernizes its mental health provider policy, there are real people, our clients, our friends, our family members who pay the price. And that's why we need you to lend your voice to this issue. Thank you very much. Dr. Fullen, you never disappoint. Your research has been key in helping the ACA government affairs team with our efforts on Capitol Hill. I'm sure all listening in today are thankful for your work. Thank you for sharing your expertise today. We now have Dwayne France. Dwayne is the Director of Veteran Services at the Family Life Center in Colorado Springs, Colorado. He is also co-chair of the Public Policy Committee. Dwayne? Thank you very much, Brian, and uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, glad to have been able to chair the Public Policy and Legislation Committee this past year with Dr. Fullen. Uh, this is a significant issue in the military and veteran community. I see some of the conversation uh, in the chat and in the questions. Um, things like there are a large number of veterans who are 
uh, catastrophically wounded, ill, and injured. Uh, these are not typically senior veterans, but these are younger veterans who, uh, for one reason or another, are on Medicare, which is helpful for them, uh, but also uh, keeps them from seeing professional counselors. So um, this is one of the primary issues, uh, the, the Medicare issue for, um, for the Public Policy and Legislation Committee. Uh, I'd, I'd like to talk very briefly on another policy initial, initiative that we have. Um, one of our goals this year uh, is to increase professional counselors serving the military and veteran community. Uh, some of that is the, um, the work that we're doing uh, uh, with the Mission Act and, and partnering with the Department of Veterans Affairs to ensure that community members um, have, or community providers have access to supporting um, uh, veterans uh, through referrals to the Mission Act, uh, but very specifically, and as Gila had mentioned, we have been working very closely um, with the um, VA Department, uh, VA Office of Mental Health at the main VA. Um, there are a number of different initiatives that we're working with on the VA. So first, uh, the Office of Academic Affiliation, uh, which is a part of the Department of Veterans Affairs Central Office uh, mental health, uh, um, the Department of Mental Health, uh, they actually have um, eight different programs around the U.S. Uh, they have a number of different uh, um, opportunities under the VA Mental Health Education Expansion Initiative. Uh, this is where a, a current um, uh, hospital or hospital network or VISN can apply to Department of VA to be able to support licensed professional mental health counselors. Uh, Dr. Pollack um, uh, discussed this with us, the last um, uh, Institute for Leadership Training. Um, we do have currently eight LPMHC training programs. What these are, um, are uh, affiliated universities with a local uh, healthcare network, um, have a program in place in which there are LPMHCs on staff to be able to provide um, uh, provide supervision to student internees. Um, one of the main concerns that we hear when we talk about Department of Veterans Affairs is the, the wide range of nomenclature uh, when it comes to uh, professional counselors, whether it's an LPCC or an LPC uh, or what have you. In the Department of Veterans Affairs, they are considered LPMHC. Um, individuals to be hired by the Department of Veterans Affairs um, do need to be uh, fully licensed in their state. Uh, there is some current legislation uh, that is um, being considered, uh, specifically the Commander John Scott Hannon Mental Health Care Improvement Act of 2019. Uh, there have been a, um, a number of different initiatives uh, to hire LPMHCs into the Department of Veterans Affairs, and this legislation very much does um, advance some of that. Uh, for example, uh, Section 503 of this, um, of this legislation um, creates an occupational series and staffing improvement plan specifically for licensed professional counselors. Um, this will require the VA to create an occupational series the same way that they have for psychologists and licensed clinical social workers. Um, also, Section 505, the establishment of the Department of Veterans Affairs Readjustment Counseling Scholarship Program. Um, this is similar to a program that the Department of Veterans Affairs has that uh, provides scholarships for clinical social workers. This would establish a, uh, a scholarship for uh, counselors who want to become um, uh, counselors in the readjustment program, specifically or, or commonly known as the vet centers, um, in which uh, the VA would pay for a student's um, counseling program, uh, and then that individual would have a certain um, uh, uh, obligation to the VA for a period of years. Um, a, a third thing is that um, this bill will require a general report on the number and the uh, distribution of professional counselors in the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, and this will uh, require the VA to come back and report to Congress um, how they are progressing on licensed professional mental health counselors uh, in the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, there are a number of different initiatives. Um, it, it may not seem like it, and especially when professional counselors are working with their local vision, um, but there are actually licensed professional mental health counselors that are 
uh, being hired by the main VA uh, and uh, as, as well as our continued um, presence in the uh, vet centers and the readjustment counseling. Um, one of the main concerns that, uh, that the main VA has is they can recommend to local um, uh, healthcare uh, networks and the visions, um, but all the hiring is done at the local level. So one thing we do suggest is that those providers in the community that want to help access more um, uh, LPMHCs uh, is to connect with their local healthcare networks uh, or uh, community-based outreach clinics uh, confer with those colleagues and determine what you can do to support LPMHCs in the local, in your local area. Um, the, a lot of the guidance from Maine VA um, has to then be taken up by each local um, uh, network and vision. And also uh, very much do uh, recommend that you consider, uh, take a look at the Commander John Scott Hannon Mental Health Care Improvement Act. Um, recently, uh, again, uh, has been moved forward, uh, but it is considered um, one of the uh, primary ways that we're going to be addressing uh, VA and veteran mental health uh, in the community. Um, very simple, very uh, very brief slides, uh, but I appreciate everyone's interest. I appreciate everyone's attendance, and uh, I thank you for taking an interest. Thank you, Dwayne. The work you are doing for our vets and the profession is amazing. Our next speaker is Government Affairs Specialist Dominique Marsalik, who will share updates on our state advocacy strategy. Dominique? Hi, folks. We understand that it has been a long and difficult process as all of us shift gears in our professional and personal lives in order to address the COVID-19 crisis impacting the entire country. ACA's government affairs and public policy team remain dedicated to our members throughout this crisis and beyond. To better aid states in their continued efforts, our team has put together a resource package comprised of guidance, templates, updates, and necessary information. If you go to counseling.org, government affairs state issues, you'll find an instructional memo which will assist the counseling community and outreach with state leaders charged with navigating policy and procedure during a time of crisis or emergency. You will find a template letter to state governors. This letter is a resource for states interested in outreach to their governors on telebehavioral health policy during COVID-19. And finally, you will find a guide, a compilation of state actions taken regarding telebehavioral health. It is not exhausted and will be updated periodically. The dangerous and life-threatening reality of COVID-19 has resulted in states reorienting legislative and policy priorities toward the immediate needs of the crisis. So while ACA remains committed to the long-term needs of the profession and the community served, it is advisable to pivot from any planned 2020 legislative agenda and advocacy schedule to meet the current moment. So legislative priorities that are not directly tied to COVID-19 or that require any arduous legislative lift should be focused and sh uh, shifted to the 2021 agenda. So, we have spent the past couple of months encouraging states to focus on implementation of federal emergency mandates, state emergency mandates, new board protocol, and local responses to the crisis. Additionally, we encourage states to begin planning their 2021 Hill Days, their district campaigns and outreach, and their Counseling Awareness Month activities, including governor proclamations. We are here to support you throughout. So when it comes to COVID-19 state support, we encourage states to ensure counselors are represented in their uh, governor's executive orders. This includes any executive orders having to do with telebehavioral health, insurance parity, practice across state lines, funding, appropriations, and support for rural and remote counseling services and technology. Uh, we encourage folks to reach out to their governor's office and ensure there's a resource officer and COVID-19 protocol for mental health and health providers in each state. 
and to reach out to the governor's cabinet, executive administration, to ensure that there's clear guidance from local health departments, oversight agencies, and chief accounting offices on how to implement new mental health protocol to providers, including how to bill for new protocol and services, and to ensure guidance from insurance commissioners on new protocol to providers. We encourage states to reach out to licensure boards uh, for clear guidance in COVID-19 protocol, including telebehavioral health, practice across state lines, and scope of practice during this crisis. So prior to COVID-19, our ACA government affairs and public policy team were working on a state-based policy framework. We are building up supports to states and territories in designing and implementing state-level multifaceted policy approaches dedicated to bettering the counseling community uh, through a continuum of localized strategy, programs, and guidance. So the goal is to bring states into greater alignment with each other in order to strengthen our counseling network and leverage our collective power. We aim to work with state legislators and state agencies tasked with implementation of enacted legislation, such as the Support Act, to ensure implementation is inclusive of counselors and state are issued, states are issued the guidance necessary to provide critical mental health services. And we actively support states as they advocate for a stronger mental health infrastructure and enhance counseling awareness for policymaking. So in order to accomplish this, we will work with our national ACA network and allies to advance key priorities and policy. ACA is actively sponsoring a nationwide collaboration with leading experts to lay the foundation for compact licensure. This year, ACA has entered the bill drafting phase after a year of advisory meetings with subject matter experts. ACA will work with state legislators as well as state and federal agencies to promote compact licensure and recruit allied leaders. Currently, we are, we are finishing a bill draft for stakeholder feedback. Once we've updated the language based on that feedback, ACA will be ready to work with our partners to introduce the bill into state legislators for state opt-in. This compact will act as a living contract between partner states regarding licensure portability. Uh, we are estimating about a two year time frame before states begin utilizing. And a more public facing bill draft is estimated to be ready by the fall of, by the late fall of this year. Conversion therapy bans. ACA supports states in their efforts to align local practices with current best practices. We monitor conversion therapy bans throughout the U.S. and provide strategic resources to advance uh, conversion therapy bans. Prior to COVID-19, our policy team registered a rising tide of anti-LGBTQ legislation this session at the state level. A large number of these bills would have adversely impacted the counseling profession by violating ethical standards. We worked with members and allied organizations in key states to combat this rising tide. There were numerous successes and some setbacks. We are proud to report that Virginia became the 20th state to ban this unethical practice and will continue to monitor into, monitor into and throughout 2021. Your ACA uh, government affairs team is working to ensure ethical and educational standards meet current best practices ACA is committed to promoting consistent ethical standards within the counseling profession and will foster relationships with boards, branches, and members as necessary to ensure this remains a priority. And ACA encourages states to move toward greater alignment through greater outreach, monitoring of regulatory board activity, promoting regulatory representation in key states, and providing members with resources to advocate. Additionally, we continue to monitor key policy to ensure members receive support and guidance to advocate effectively. Uh, this includes, but is not limited to, expanding insurance coverage for mental health providers, local funding and appropriations for enhanced school counseling efforts, local supports for community-based mental health programs, particularly aimed at violence prevention, student loan repayment programs specific to the counseling profession, and implementation of the Support Act in support of drug use disorder treatment programs. 
And finally, we truly encourage states uh, to, to stay engaged beyond organizational work, to build out their partnerships, their coalitions, and work within their community to utilize the tools at their disposal uh, to meet uh, not uh, an off session at their district offices with their federal representatives and their local representatives uh, to lead in their community by contacting their state governor for open board positions on mental health, regulatory matters, education, professional permitting and licensure issues. Consider running for local office with your PTA, your school board, your neighborhood uh, community organizations or private professional board memberships and outward servant organizations like Rotary International, or consider running for your state ACA board. Thank you very much. Dominique, thank you for that report and those pointers. I would now like to introduce you to Dania Lofton. Dania is our hands-on government affairs specialist that focuses on leading our grassroots efforts. Dania? Thank you, Brian. With more than 50,000 advocates, we are pleased that over 2,000 registered to attend this event this evening and 765, I believe, are on the call right now. But to be honest, this is only one, I think it's about 1.5% of our advocacy base. Our legislative advocacy efforts are charged and powered by our members, our advocates on Capitol Hill and in state legislatures. Before I continue, I want to take a poll to see how many of us on this call this evening have advocated on behalf of the counseling profession. One second, please. So we'll take a few moments and see what we have. Just a few more seconds. Three, two, one. So I'm gonna share the results with you. And it looks like quite a few of you have actually been advocating this year on behalf of the, uh, the counseling community. You see, 371 people on the call this evening have, and 130 haven't gotten around to it yet. We need more advocates to lobby their representatives in Washington, D.C., and in your state legislatures. We need you to advocate on behalf of count the counseling community for Medicare reimbursement, licensure portability, funding for more school counselors, and mental health access in general for all. And we need everyone present tonight to make sure that when you're advocating, you're advocating on behalf of the community and not just for the issues that impact you. This is a community and we need all hands on deck for all issues. So now I'll get into my report for this year about our advocacy successes. This year, we sent over 17,000 messages to members of Congress. Our Biggest legislative campaigns this year that we advocated for were federal legislation impacting council reimbursement, where we sent, where we collected 1,780 stories to share with members of Congress on Capitol Hill for Medicare reimbursement. You also supported HR 5092, the Counseling for Career Choice Act of 2019. In short, this legislation will provide grants for states for the development and implementation of statewide career counseling frameworks, which will be supported by local education agencies or secondary schools in conjunction with local businesses and industry organizations. Along the way, we've recruited 4,029 advocates this year. Some of our most active states this year, Texas, Illinois, Pennsylvania, and Louisiana. I want to really acknowledge these states because they have really hit the ground running with their legislative efforts and advocating on behalf of the counseling profession. We want the other states to join them. I want to focus on Louisiana, the Louisiana Counseling Association, just for a moment. They're the newest addition to this list and they are doing a great job with their grassroots campaigns and building up their grassroots advocacy base. Continue to do so and we want the other states to join them. 
We've worked with 28 states on state policy and regulatory priorities this year. We've seen some success, or well, we, not some, we've seen success in Iowa and Michigan in which both states regulatory boards opted not to adopt proposed legislation that either limited licensed professional counselors scope of work practice or their access to continuing education programs. This year, we've also rolled out two new initiatives, our monthly advocacy power hour, where we meet with our branch leaders, our state leaders monthly, to provide them with our legislative and policy updates, as well as our advocacy efforts. We also provide trainings and tools to strengthen and enhance your advocacy efforts at home and on Capitol Hill. We've also initiated our story collection campaign. As Gila stated earlier, as well as Matt, and I did just a few moments ago, we collect your stories to share with members of Congress on Capitol Hill, as well as your state legislators and your state legislatures. We've also updated our advocacy toolkit. This toolkit will provide you with the tools that you need to lobby your members to schedule virtual meetings. They give you a template on how to write to your legislators and other advocacy tips please visit our website, our ACA website, and visit our government affairs page to see more of our advocacy resources. Lastly, we've updated, not only that, we've also added an advocacy glossary where you can learn the terminology that we use on Capitol Hill and in your state legislatures. We're working really hard to make sure that you have everything that you need to lobby and that you have all of the information that you need to let your legislators know how important access to mental health for all is. Advocacy is really easy and it's a lot of fun. It does require some work, but it's all worth it in the end. But I don't want you just to take that from me. I want you to hear from two of your own members of the counseling profession. Both of these women are licensed professional counselors and counselor educators. Dr. Janelle Cox is an assistant professor of counselor education at Bowie State University. She will share with you her experience advocating and lobbying on behalf of the counseling profession on the federal level. And Dr. Chun Shin Taylor, who is also a counselor educator at Liberty University, as well as a licensed professional counselor and founder of Mending Hearts Academy. She will share with you her experience advocating and lobbying on the state level. We'll start with Dr. Cox. Thank you, Dania. Good evening, everyone. Like Dania mentioned, my name is Dr. Janelle Cox, and it's an honor to have the space and opportunity to talk with you this evening about one of my topics that I love talking about, advocacy. A little about myself, I started off as a community counselor, specifically working in low-end communities within clients' homes. This was where I learned and saw about many of the systematic injustices that our clients were facing in many aspects of their lives and on a daily basis. As a counselor, I often engaged in advocacy many times, but I didn't quite know where to go to continue the momentum. As I continued my career and am now an assistant professor, I still am very passionate about teaching future counselors and our profession about fighting injustices through legislations and policies. My particular advocacy story started as a doctoral student where I was voluntold, if you've heard of that term before, that I would be the advocacy chair um, of Maryland Counseling Association or MCA. I had never chaired an advocacy committee before, yet alone still wasn't really sure about how I could contribute to the advocacy committee. Engaging in advocacy at the state level, the first time I did it was extremely nerve wracking. But once I did it, I understood that as counselors, we know counseling, right? We know about the needs of our clients. We know about the injustices that they face and we know how it impacts them on a day-to-day -day basis. We know this because this is typically why they are coming to counseling. Our representatives, they don't know this. And so this is what continued keep me to keep trying um, to move forward and continue to do advocacy work. Specifically at the federal level, I had the opportunity the past two summers to attend ILT through ACA. 
one of my main goals going in was to learn as much as I could about being an advocate at the legislative level. And so I figured this was where I needed to be. Um, when I attended ILT, it was really an amazing experience both times I went because I had the opportunity to be in the space with others who were passionate about advocacy and they were able to share with me their experiences. Um, what I had found is up until that point for me, there were very limited opportunities that talked about um, strictly public policy legislation and advocacy or the skills to be an advocate. So kind of the how to. Um, what the training at ILT helped me do was they brought in staffers that then talked to us about the whole experience. They gave us tips and pointers about how to be successful. And in all, this training really helped me to feel confident, to learn about what the representatives, kind of what their lens were, that they weren't these foreign people that kind of sit above us. Um, we are their constituents, and so we have the right to go and talk to them. Um, and lastly, it also taught me how to talk about the issues that I knew were pertinent within counseling and also critical to my story. When I went to the Hill, I had the opportunity to go with other Marylanders. So this significantly um, decreased the nerves that I felt about the process. Um, we decided kind of beforehand to get our game plan together. Um, but we um, we got our game plan together and we decided last summer was the issue was um, Medicare. And so Matt had done just an amazing presentation about it. And so we had that down. We talked about who would say which client stories, who were going to talk about any personal stories that they had that impacted them. We got together who was going to talk about the specific specific statistics because representatives want to know how their constituents are being impacted. And so overall, the whole process was 15 to 20 minutes long. So it was really critical we had our elevator speech ready and that we were kind of in it together. When I left, I made sure to email my representatives to recap what was going on and try to get an idea of where they were swaying with the legislation. And I still try to continue um, to do it because the experience was very empowering and it's something that I bring into the classroom um, to teach to my students as well. So to end here, I encourage each of us to work together to continue advocating at the legislative level. Thank you again for coming out tonight. This is a continued step that we're all making towards becoming advocates for the counseling profession and our clients. Thank you, Dr. Cox. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Chun Shin Taylor. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chun Shin Taylor. It is my honor to be here today and to um, share a little bit about my experience when I went to Annapolis for the first time in my 20 years of my life here in the United States, not only just for pleasure, but for the greater and better uh, purpose uh, in my life. Uh, I, mainly working, um, I mainly work with the Asian descendants in my uh, clinical practices and uh, my patient uh, for them is really to help them understand what's the culture and the religion, spirituality, or the social factors that impact their um, emotional and relational well-being. So when I decided to go to Maryland Counseling Associate um, Advocacy Day was really not about my personal uh, story per se. I really wanted to share my story, my sons, my daughters, stories and all my clients' story that are so commonly shared. Um, so it was really meaningful for me. And um, just like, you know, I'm a fairly good student. So I really wanted to do well when I get there. So before the counseling um, advocacy day, I really studied, uh, literally, I felt like I was like becoming a high school student before the big test. I really wanted to study each uh, the legislation uh, bills that was suggested. And I found two of them that I can personally and clinically and connected that I really wanted to advocate. Um, it was very confusing because I never been uh, any events like this before. And um, I, again, I really wanted to do well. Uh, one really exciting thing from the event was that not only I got to meet um, 
lieutenant governor in Maryland, but also I get to actually talk to uh, my delegate in my district because um, I got a scholarship from her twice when during my doctoral program. So I really wanted to say thank you in person rather than a letter that I already sent like twice. Uh, when I met uh, her secretary because she was busy, I was really um, uh, feeling fueled almost, energized by sharing my son's story that he became um, almost uh, invisible child, just like I was invisible for past 20 years. I kept trying to talk about my experiences, but it never seems like working or nobody seems to really pay, pay attention to. So when I was really sharing my son's being bullied in school, he's a seventh grade, but the school that I tried to advocate for my son, just like many of my clients that come to my office, I really tried to advocate for them, but it really didn't seem to be working, despite my numerous emails and phone calls and such. Um, so when I was sharing my story that my son almost becoming like me, walking the similar, uh, the path like me, I saw uh, my delegate secretary actually making a note and she was able to relate with me because she was also a school uh, teacher. And at that moment, I really felt like someone finally uh, listening. Someone really uh, have a heart to do something different. And that's the moment that delegate walked in. I was uh, fascinated about getting to know her in person a little bit more and just uh, having a small conversation about my experiences, how much I was thankful, how much I was appreciative of her support during my school year. After all, I really um, learned from this experience that as long as I keep talking, just like I am keep talking, I know my time's come to an end, but as long as I keep talking, not only for myself, for my clients, my sons, my daughters, a lot of community people that I see in my neighborhood, as long as I'm talking and I don't give up, someday somebody will listen and I'm really hoping the change will happen. And I'm glad that I am here today to share some of my stories. I highly encourage you, everyone, be at your state um, counselors advocacy day and just to feel what's like to let your voice out there, not only for you, but for some other clients, other community people that you belong to. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Taylor and Dr. And Dr. Taylor. So as you heard them say, I literally heard them say, it's easy and it's fun. So here's what we need you to do. We have a call to action on the screen now, and we want you to participate in our grassroots challenge. Three simple tasks. One, sign up to receive our voter voice alerts and respond to all of them. Remember, we need to make sure that we are advocating for all counseling issues. They're usually just a few clicks and then they're off to your legislators. Secondly, we need you to share your story with us so that we can continue to share these stories with your representatives. And third, we need you to complete and submit the virtual town hall feedback survey so that we can learn more about the issues that matter to you most and continue to advocate on your behalf. So why should you get involved? It's really simple. We need you. You are the key. You are the most valuable tool that we have. You are the subject matter experts on the counseling profession. You're the constituent. Legislators want and need to hear from you. Every day, governmental entities and policymakers are making decisions that affect you and your profession. Don't let them do that without you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taylor and Dr. Cox. Your stories of advocating on behalf of the profession are inspirational for all. And thank you, Dania, for sharing the work you're doing for our members. Before we get to question and answer, are you interested in becoming a member? There are many advantages to being a member, as you see on your screen. Email membershipmatters at counseling.org. That's membershipmatters, all one word, at counseling.org. And someone from our member engagement team will get back to you. At this time, I would like to ask all of our panelists to turn your cameras back on for our question period. 
So let's take some questions. As a reminder, you can enter your questions by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. We have one question that came in already from Deborah Metroka. This question is for you, Mr. Todd. I hear emphasis on adding mental health counselors to be covered by Medicare, but I am an LCPC. Are LCPCs going to be covered? Uh, oh, can you guys hear me? Can you hear me, Brian? We can so, hear you. so the short answer, the short answer is yes. Um, so throughout the country, uh, licensed professional counselors are known. Some places, some states are known as LPCs. Other places are known as LPMHCs. Um, when we go, to, members of Congress usually refer to licensed professional counselors or licensed professional mental health counselors as just mental health counselors across the board. Um, but just know, anytime we're advocating for anyone in the counseling profession, everyone is included. And also, when we send out action alerts, um, everyone is also included. But in the future, because I know there's some, there's been some confusion with this. In the future, we're going to provide a note explaining this when we send out action alerts or any advocacy updates in the future. So I hope that answered your question. Thank you, Gila. Second question coming in is for Dominique from Mr. Joshua Harris. With the impact of COVID-19 being uncertain and potentially having continuation of telehealth-based services through an uncertain future, is there going to be future policy which makes telehealth part of the standard or at least more affordable? Great question. Uh, so for folks who might not know, Telebehavioral health or distance counseling is the use of a digital platform that provides secure encrypted audio video conferencing to communicate with a client in real time. So this does not include communication that is not in real time, such as text, digital chats, emails to and from counselors and their clients. Uh, so telebehavioral health is included in our work on the interstate compact. So any state signing onto the compact will be agreeing to allow counselors to use this modality, which is wonderful. Um, ACA has also been making a great effort to provide state updates on telebehavioral health regulations, insurance commission data, and Medicaid guidance during COVID-19. You can find this information and guidance on the ACA website under the Government Affairs Header State Issues tab. Also, our knowledge and learning team has provided resources on our website that can be found on our ACA homepage under the COVID-19 header. These resources offer insight on ethical ramifications, licensure requirements, and practical advice for application. Um, we will continue to monitor these issues and work with state branches to pursue policy that works for each state. Thank you, Dominique. We now have two questions that have come in through the chat. First is Dr. Audrey Ilion. Please introduce yourself. Dr. Ilion. We're not hearing from Dr. Ilion, so let's move to our next question. We'll come back to you, Dr. Ilion. Hello. Met Dr. Oh, there she is. Hi. There you go. <laughs> I have I've enjoyed the presentation thus far and I do have a question for our panelists. What are the most effective ways to petition our state and federal officials to address our legislation needs? Gil and Dominique, would you all like to take that? Sure. Um, so one of the best ways and I always tell this to anyone who wants to advocate for not just Medicare reimbursement or any of our legislation, is that our legislatures, our legislators really want to hear your stories um, because you guys are on the front lines and your boots on the ground and you have that experience dealing with clients on a day-to-day -day basis. So they want to really they want to really know how this legislation really affects you and your communities. Absolutely. And if you have any further follow up questions about that, our team would love to help you stay involved. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Mary Fiducia. Mary? Thank you. Um, I was wondering about 
the telemental health aspect because right now, according to our board, we can provide it, you know, with qualifications um, during this COVID-19 period. But moving forward, do you think there's going to be a standard set for it to be provided um, across the board? This Great question. Telemental health. Great question. Dominique, would you like to take that? Sure. Uh, thank you for this question. Um, it is a important question that folks are asking a lot these days. Um, so, so you know, uh, telebehavioral health uh, is included in our work on the interstate compact. So going forward, ACA is working to ensure that telehealth is uh, allowed for counselors and this modality is included in our interstate compact. Um, and we have uh, resources on our government affairs uh, webpage. If you go to counseling.org, government affairs, state issues, you will find resources for telebehavioral health there. And we Thanks. are going to continue to monitor these issues and work with our state branches to pursue policy for state that works uh, for states that work because this is an incredibly important issue. Thank you very much. Thank you for that answer, Dominique. I see one question in the chat from Sandra and Sandra, please excuse me if I butcher your last name, Sandra Kakasik. And the question reads, will the language be an issue LPC, LCPC, LMHC? because states have different titles. I'll take that on. Gilly gave some great information on that. The, the concern was well, not really a concern, but the issue that we do find is each state may use a different term to, for, for the title of mental health counselors. On Capitol Hill, you hear our members say licensed professional mental health counselor or just mental health counselor. That covers the entire gamut of the mental health counseling profession. We know that it, it is difficult and it causes some confusion, but we want to let you all know again that it does cover everyone across the board. Let's see, we have a couple more minutes to take, well, we have, probably have time for just one more. Going to the chat. Here's a question that we see often, and I'd like to pass this one to Gila or Rich. Uh, the question is about our students, and the question is how do we get, should students advocate, and how can they get involved? Sure, uh, I'll start. Uh, students, what you obviously know is that um, advocacy is part and parcel of what counseling is all about, and so you have a right as a citizen to uh, lobby your, your elected officials, and especially because you are advocating for something that would benefit not only your clients, but the constituents um, of those elected officials. So absolutely, you should participate in the process and in the system. I'm sorry, Gila, would you like to add anything? I think I was on mute, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I piggyback on what, what Rich said. I think as a student, you should absolutely advocate for your profession as well as yourself. Like Rich said, you're a constituent. Um, legislat legislators want to hear from you. And, you know, and you should utilize the power that you have as a constituent, as well as someone in the counseling community, because like I said earlier, they want to hear your stories and they want to hear your journey as not only a constituent, but also as a, as a licensed professional counselor. Thank you, Gila. Ladies and gentlemen, that is all the time we have today for questions. Please look out for a future article on counseling today that will answer all questions that we were unable to get to at this time. Please remember to complete the feedback survey. The link to the survey is in the chat box now and will also be emailed to you if you're unable to stay on. I would like to once again thank all of our presenters, the Honorable Mike Thompson, and for you to, for joining us this evening. Have a great rest of the week, everybody.